um, I did is I got started in business with my friend Barry. And Barry and I uh, started a staffing company in Detroit. And we had a lot of success. And apparently YouTube's still not working. So um, we had a lot of success, but I never had to raise money for that. We just started it. We muscled through it. And I was so glad I didn't have to raise money. So glad that we were able to just start it up with a lot of sweat equity. But then I started investing in real estate. And I started doing my own deals, started flipping houses. And uh, that went really, really well. Um, then, then I started, I moved over to um, uh, building houses from the ground up. Then I started flipping lots. And I eventually realized that I would not uh, be able to continue to finance all my own deals. And so I got kind of nervous and I started wondering, hey, how am I going to raise money for my real estate deals? And so I began to ask a few friends and family. Thankfully, I had some uh, doctors that were friends of mine, some other wealthy people, and I was able to get um, uh, I was able to get debt financing from them. And so um, I began to get friends and family money. And I did that from 2002 to about 2008. And of course, we all know what happened in 2008. That was a lot of fun. Thankfully, I only had one investor at, and it was a small amount of money. I think it was like, well, it's a medium-sized amount of money, like $100,000 in 2008. And I was able to refinance him out of the deal. So I was able to get all his money back to him. But in 2011, we started doing ground-up multifamily. And when we started doing ground-up multifamily, we realized we were going to need to get more capital, more debt, more equity, and just in general, uh, a lot more capital than we had. And so... Uh, thankfully, I had a group of friends and I was able to raise money for them again. And so I only had to raise like a million dollars or less and I was able to do it. Then I got into class B multifamily. And when I got into class B multifamily, I decided to hire a mentor. Now, folks, if you haven't hired a mentor for real estate investing, I highly recommend it. It's been one of the best things I've ever done. And I'll never regret the $25,000 I spent on a mentor. I can still call them, email them, text them anytime I want, and they will get back with me. They will give me answers. So I'm, I'm so happy to have hired a mentor. And if anybody wants to hire a mentor, I can tell you who I hired. Uh, just reach out to me directly uh, at Bigger Pockets. But anyway, so this mentor, as part of the pr training program, said, you've got to learn to raise millions of dollars for your deals. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, and I wasn't really confident about it. You know, I, I had this latent ability to raise money, I guess. But, um, you know, someone just asked me a question. What's class B multifamily investing? I'm sorry. So class B, instead of doing ground up multifamily like from the ground up building, which is what we did in North Dakota, we actually um, were buying 20, 30, 40 year old multifamily. I'm talking about, you know, 100 units and up, you know, 5, 10, 15 million dollars. So we had to get debt and we had to get equity. And my mentor gave us all this training on how to raise money. Well, I really didn't want to do it. Anybody ever had to do something you really, really didn't want to do? Anybody ever been told, hey, you need to go out and do this, and you were trying to find a way around it? Well, that's what I did. I started trying to get a way around all the training. I didn't want to develop a pipeline of hundreds of potential investors. I didn't want to develop a database of maybe a thousand people I was sending regular emails to. I felt like I'd be begging. I felt, it felt like, you know, I don't mind sales. I think sales is great, but I really didn't want to be doing sales to get investors. It just seemed like it had, I mean, I had been sold to as a potential investor in other people's deals and I never liked the feeling I got. So 
I really decided that there would probably be a better way to do it. So I called a friend of mine in China who had access to all these very, very wealthy investors in China. And I said, hey, Ben, you've been investing, uh, you've been investing very large sums of money in commercial real estate in the U.S. Like, you know, that they bought a mall. And they bought, a, you know, a 300-unit multifamily. They did a ground-up multifamily for like $100 million, I think, from these different projects in Los Angeles. They bought large, large hotels. I mean, they were investing 50 to $100 million at a time. And so my thinking was, if they were investing 50 to $100 million, surely they wouldn't mind investing 3 or $4 million with me. And so I got it in my head that they would be my investor. And I sent them a lot of information. My contact, who's from Dallas, but had moved to China, said, hey, this all looks really, really good. Um, we really like to invest, you know, at least 20 million or more in deals. And I'm like, yeah, 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 you know. So I tried to ignore that. Well, the first time we got a deal, we needed investors. I didn't have a group of investors. I didn't have a database of investors to call on. I had this one guy in China. So I excitedly tried to get hold of him. I think this was in like February of a year, many, many years ago. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, it's Chinese New Year. And everybody's shut down over here for, you know, for a while. So I don't think we'll be able to get you an answer on this. We better pass on this. And I thought, oh, okay. So it's like, two days like you know we have new year's eve and new year's day right so i thought oh well a couple days right and i got back with him like a week later he's like no no you don't understand like we're shut down over here for like a month so sorry we're gonna pass and i'm thinking he's got the opportunity of a lifetime here and he's gonna pass on it because it's new year's i'm thinking so we missed that deal <laughs> so about six months later i had another deal and I think I needed to raise like three or four million. And I didn't have any investors, no database. I hadn't done any of the work my mentor told me to. And I said, okay, surely they're going to want to invest in this one, right? You know it. And so I, I uh, called him up and I, I laid out the deal. And he's like, you know, uh, we really do love commercial real estate in the U.S. But like I said, we really want to do 20 million minimum. I'm like, yeah, but this is less than that. Isn't that easier? And what I found out that day, and this is not the big mindset shift. I haven't started that yet. What I found out that day is it's a lot easier for an investor to a, a large group of investors to evaluate a $20 million deal than it is a two or three. There's a number of reasons for this, but the main reason is this. It's going to take them the same amount of effort to evaluate a small deal as it is a large deal but the due diligence costs aren't really worth it for how little they'll make on a small deal. And I was like, yeah, but you, you know, we think we can make 15% a year profit or, you know, whatever ROI. And they're like, yeah, but 15% of 3 million, you know, that just doesn't even move the needle for us. That's not enough to matter. And so I don't, um, he basically said no again. So I had my tail between my legs. We missed that deal. We didn't have it under contract. I mean, I, I wanted to get the money first. And I called my mentor one day, and I had my business partner on the phone and my young employee, who was a recent college grad. His name also happened to be Ben. And he was on the phone with me, and we were talking to my mentor. Now, my mentor is very, very direct. And if you want a mentor, you want someone who will hurt your feelings sometimes because Sometimes you're going to need your feelings hurt. Well, I sure did, but that's, uh, I'll get to that in a second. So I'm on the call with them and I'm saying, you know, I got this one big Chinese investor. I guess we just have to get bigger deals. We have to get, you know, like a $20 million deal or something like that, you know? And he's like, listen, you're deluded. No one is going to give you 10 or 20 or any millions of dollars to just, when you're just getting started. These are sophisticated investors that money from China is never going to come to you, or at least not for many, many years. Um, and I said, yeah, but I've got all this experience. We did this ground up multifamily. We sold it for $8 million. I did this Hyatt Hotel, did this, did that, did all these flips. He's like, listen, Paul, 
don't call me again until you've done what I said. And then he pretty briskly got off the phone. I was appalled. Wait a minute. I paid this guy for a lifetime subscription to issues. No, seriously, a lifetime subscription to his mentoring program. How dare, how dare he tell me, don't call me again until you've done what I said. But it hurt, but it hurt in a way I needed to hear. And my uh, other guys on the phone with me, they didn't say much, but I kind of thought would, knew what they were thinking. Well, it turns out that the next day I was... Michael Blanc, B-L-A-N-K, a, a, a big favorite from Bigger Pockets, um, actually was coming to town. And so I went to see Michael Blanc and I kind of sheepishly walked up to him to talk to him. And I got to know him a little bit and I realized he had incredible training on bigger uh, on, on uh, real estate and multifamily. He has a great program. But one of the things he talked about that night was raising capital. And some of the things he said really stuck with me. But it was what happened a week later that was the simple mind sh mindset shift. I almost said it again. Mindset shift that allowed me to raise millions and then eventually tens of millions of dollars. So here it is, okay? So I was going with my wife to Harrisburg, PA, we're in Virginia, and there's a certain department store she loves uh, to stop at along the way on I-81 in Maryland, I think. And um, so we, uh, we were stopping one day and I was sitting in the car because, you know, I was so gracious not to go in the store with her because I just would have been nagging her about when are we, you know, are we done yet? And so I was sitting in the car and I knew a friend of mine had told me about this little purple app on my phone. And this purple app, you guys might recognize, uh, this purple app is the podcast app, right? And this is where you can listen to podcasts. Now, I didn't know anything about podcasts. It's down here in the corner of my bottom bar here on my iPhone. I didn't know much about podcasts. I had listened to a few over the years, but I didn't know anything about the podcast app. Well, I flipped it on and I put in raising capital or raising money for real estate, something like that. And I came across a podcast by Richard C. Wilson. He's the family office club. He's got tons of great content out there about raising capital, by the way. And in there, he told this story. And this story is the mindset shift that allowed me to change everything. Here it is. Okay, if you get nothing else, I hope you get this. He said, if you went up north and you wanted to live on salmon, you might want to become a spear fisherman, you know? So let's say you're up in Canada or like the Pacific Northwest, you could be a, become a spear fisherman and you could actually get a pretty, you would have a pretty good chance of surviving. He said, you'd have to learn to whittle and cut the right straight limb from a tree. You'd have to find the limb and you'd have to learn to whittle it into a spear, number one. Number two, you'd have to learn to throw these spears accurately. Number three, you'd have to stand by the dark stream and hope that a salmon swam, swam by. Number four, you'd have to hope that you had good aim and that you could hit the salmon with your spear. Number five, you'd have to hope that you could haul it in. Did you hear all those hopes? Hope is not a business strategy, my friends. And so the analogy is that if you're chasing salmon, if you're the one, if you're out there spearfishing, trying to spear them, trying to chase them, it's like chasing investors. It could work, but it'd be really, really hard to get a lot of investors. Let me tell you something. Investors hate to be chased. It's like a used car salesman that's just overdoing all the features and benefits. And you know you can't wait to get out of there and get back home. Okay, but it's much worse for investment. If you buy a used car, you might lose a few thousand dollars if you get a lemon. But if you're a large investor, you could lose 50, 100,000, half a million or more. It's a big, big deal. And you do not want to chase these investors because if they feel chased, they're going to feel pressure. They're going to feel like you're desperate. There's so many reasons. Put yourself in a large investor's shoes and realize 
This is not a good strategy. And that's what spear fishing's like. Here's the mindset shift finally. This is where the analogy becomes really silly, Nate. Sorry. Sorry to all of you, but it's a silly analogy, but I love it. And I talked about this before on Bigger Pockets. You could also become a grizzly bear. Ha ha. Now, if you were a grizzly bear, you could actually stand in the waterfall, in the stream when the salmon were running, and you could unhinge your jaw. I'm not going to imitate that. You could unhinge your jaw and let the salmon just jump into your mouth. I mean, you basically just turn your head and salmon are jumping around you. Hundreds of salmon are jumping into your mouth, okay? And if you haven't seen the pictures of this, go Google it. It's so cool. I'm waiting for somebody, Nate, to uh, frame a picture of one of these uh, grizzly bear. I was kidding about Nate, Zach, uh, to <laughs> a grizzly bear with these salmon jumping into their mouth. I would love to have a framed picture of that because I, I, we've built a lot around that. And, but anyway, the, the analogy is this. You need to be a grizzly bear standing in the waterfall. It's totally different from a spear fisherman. Now, how does that relate again to ca raising capital? You need to be able to position yourself where the fish, where the salmon are coming to you, okay? And there's more than just, if this is not just some tactic, this is a complete new way of thinking, okay? Here's how you do it. You don't go chase investors. You don't go brush up on your sales skills. You don't go take all the sales training classes. You don't, you know, try to learn how to convince investors to like your deal. All that smells. It smells like rotten salmon, in fact. What you want to do is you want to become the grizzly bear in the waterfall. And to do that, you have to generate content really, really high quality content. And to do that, you need to be a great experienced real estate investor. Go out, get the experience, go out, get the know-how, go out and get the education, go out and, you know, get a mentor, learn this, do it, team up with other people. Think about this. You should not be raising millions of dollars unless you have all that under your belt anyway. I know that's probably going to be the painful words that someone needed to hear, but it's true. You shouldn't be raising millions of dollars for real estate deals if you don't have the experience, if you don't have the education and the knowledge and the know-how. Now, dude, real estate... Um, by the way, that's Nate Shields, my friend from Madison, Wisconsin. He's answering a lot of questions over here on the YouTube side. So it, that allows me to talk unhindered and allows you guys to get your questions answered. Thank you so much, dude, Nate uh, Shields. Nate is a writer for Bigger Pockets as well. And Nate also has some really great mentoring programs. So uh, check out Dude Real Estate. But anyway, so... What does it mean to generate content? Well, first of all, it means you've got the experience, got the education. Now you've got to go find a platform. Now, Michael Hyatt, you might want to write that down. Michael Hyatt, H-Y-A-T-T, -T, was the, I think, the president or CEO of Thomas Nelson Publishing. Thomas Nelson Publishing is based in Nashville. He no longer is the CEO of that, but he is a great uh, author, podcaster, blogger. He's got a great book out called Platform. Platform. You want to check out that book. It will give you all kinds of ideas for how to develop a content platform. He'll teach you what some of the things that great marketers are doing. Some of you also might know of Gary Vaynerchuk. Now, Gary's got a mouth on him, but Gary's got a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge in uh, developing a platform and getting the word out there. And so Gary is... Somebody I also recommend. He talks a lot about this. He, he does it really well, but he talks about it too, just like Michael Hyatt uh, and his company do. There's all kinds of other people out there with great platforms, but uh, what would a platform look like for you? Well, um, I just got a call from my friend Eric Eikhoff earlier. Eric's got incredible real estate uh, experience. He's got investing experience, brokerage experience. He's bought, he's sold, he's helped others buy and sell. He lists, he sells. He's got all kinds of amazing 
information out there. And he doesn't have a, a platform. So we were talking, I said, you know, you should be blogging on bigger pockets. It would be an incredible thing for you to do. And so I'm hoping Eric's going to do that. Now, some of you might also want to start a blog. So you can start your own blog. Uh, that's one way to develop a platform. Now, if you don't have a big following already, you might want to go get a following. And the way to do that is get involved on Bigger Pockets. By the way, if you're not a Bigger Pockets Pro or Premium member, I highly recommend you consider it. It's been one of the best things I have ever done. Now, um, but to get a following on Bigger Pockets, there's a couple of things you're doing. You can do number one, you could actually um, comment on a lot of the forums. You could comment on the forums. You can contact, you can answer people's questions. You can get really, really involved on Bigger Pockets. This is a free community, a sharing community, uh, the largest community of real estate investors in the world who really, really want to help each other and want to help each other do well. And so you can get involved on Bigger Pockets forums. A second thing you can do is get involved on the Bigger Pockets uh, blogs. You can start a blog within Bigger Pockets and start getting the word out yourself. A third thing you can do is you can actually become an official vlogger on Bigger Pockets, and that takes some doing, but it is possible to do. Another thing you can do is write a book. Now, writing a book is not easy, but if you have all that knowledge and education, you'll be surprised. Once you start typing, you'll realize that you can do, you can write, you have a lot of stuff stored up in your head. You have a lot of ideas. When I started the How to Lose Money podcast, I didn't think I'd have that many stories about losing money. And I didn't need to have that many because we have a guest every week. But it's nice to have some things to comment on. But as I started talking about that, I realized I had more ideas and more thoughts and memories than I had initially remembered. It's the same thing when you start writing. When you start blogging, you can actually turn those blogs into content like eBooks or like little YouTube videos, okay? You can also um, turn those into larger special reports and eBooks, and you put those together and they can become a book. Now, it's hard to publish a book, but it's easier than ever. You can find a publisher, <clears throat> excuse me, like Bigger Pockets or Morgan James Publishing or others, and you can publish or you can self-publish. You know, you can get books printed one at a time now through Amazon. Seriously, if you had a book and, you know, that book, The Shack, that guy from The Shack that wrote that book, Paul Young or whatever, he only wanted to print like six copies, one for himself, his wife, and his however many kids he had, I guess that before. I think he only wanted to print six copies. Well, you can do that. You can start small. You don't have to order thousands of copies. You can buy a, um, you know, you can print a few at a time and start giving them out at trade shows and your real estate investment clubs, et cetera. And you can start um, getting the word out through your book. Now, once you have a book, you can also get a, be a, get a guest spot on podcast. Now, I didn't know how easy this would be. Actually, it wasn't that easy. But I started getting guest slots on podcasts once I had a book in 2016. It was actually my second book on real estate investing. You can actually... Uh, Put yourself out there, get a one-page summary of who you are, and start applying to be on podcasts. And once you apply, you can start, you know, you'll get on podcasts as a guest. Whitney Sewell does a daily podcast. I've been on his twice on real estate syndication. Joe Fairless does a daily podcast. I've been on his twice. I've been on the Bigger Pockets podcast. I've been on lots of other podcasts. I've actually been on over 125. And there are ways to get on these podcasts. That's a phenomenal way to get the word out, to get content out there so people will come to you to get to know you. They'll ask you about getting to know you about investing. You'll be like the grizzly bear in the waterfall. So you can start your own podcast. I mentioned that I have a podcast called How to Lose Money. It's not as hard as you might think. There's a Sweet Fish Media my friend James at Sweetfish Media can help you get a podcast started. And uh, once you start that podcast, you can start getting the word out. You can start uh, meeting people. People will come to you and ask you for advice. People will ask you about buying your book. It will basically be a self-generating platform once you get 
your own podcast. Now, what else can you do? You could, um, let's see, what else? You could start speaking at events. You could actually put yourself out there as a subject matter expert for local you know, clubs, real estate investing clubs. I've spoken at like three of those, maybe four. Um, you can put your name out there and start speaking at other kinds of events, bigger pockets, regional events. You can start your own club. You know, with meetup.com, you can start a meetup. And if you're the head of the meetup, you're going to have some credibility from day one when people come. And so you'll have a chance to uh, show that credibility off and people will ask you, hey, what are you investing in? Well, if you're the head of the club, um, I've got a friend in Richmond who started a club. It has like 40 people showing up. Uh, Adam Adams in Denver started something like seven different real estate meetups or maybe a dozen by now. Um, and he is the authority now. Now, I hadn't heard of Adam before, but now lots and lots and lots of people, including a lot of you on here right now, have heard of Adam Adams. Whitney Sewell, same thing. Once he got his daily podcast going, lots of people heard of him, and now he's pretty well known, and he's raising money for real estate deals. So this is the grizzly bear in the waterfall uh, mindset. This simple mindset shift could help you raise millions or tens of millions of dollars. Now, if you want to get notes on what I just talked about, you don't need to because my next article on Bigger Pockets is called something like, we haven't got a final title, uh, This Simple Mindset Shift Could Help You Raise Millions for Your Real Estate Deals. So, has this been helpful? If so, please give me a thumbs up, a like, a share, something like that. Give me a smiley face. Uh, I, I'd love to hear from you. Bigger Pockets would love to hear from you. I want to make sure I don't get fired. Uh, so please uh, give me a, a comment there and let me know what you think of this information. It is the bottom of the hour. It's 4.30 Eastern, 2.30 Mountain. And that means it's time for Real Estate Q&A. So thankfully, Nate Shields, my friend at Dude Real Estate, has been answering lots and lots of questions on the YouTube side. So here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. If you've got a question, I'm gonna ask you um, to <laughs> please put it in now. And there's been dozens and dozens, probably over 100 questions come through on YouTube and um, I, I can't go back and answer them. Thank you, Tu Fang. Tu Fang's my friend from St. Paul, Minnesota. So thanks to uh, Brittany Nicole Hinkle. Hello, Brittany says, thanks for sharing. Jeremy says, love Gary Vaynerchuk. Curtis Bennett says, hey, Paul, send me your address. And I'll get you that picture. What? I'm beginning my second year of flipping houses full time. And I just signed on deal three and four. How many deals did you make before feeling like you needed to expanding, expand your lending network? Curtis, I'm, I'm pretty blown away and I, I was kind of kidding about the picture, but if you reach out to me on Bigger Pockets, I will send you my address. You are way too kind and I, I, I hopefully, hopefully you guys knew I was kidding, but I, I will not turn down a gift like that. Thank you. Uh, Curtis, just reach out to me. Yeah, you know, once I did about three deals, uh, I realized we might need more cash than we had available. So when I had three deals in the hopper, and I was looking to do three or four more. You know, I always kind of jump into things big. I'm at seven on the Enneagram scale. And so, Curtis, I jumped in and thought, well, we could do like one deal a week. Or maybe maybe at least, you know, two deals a month every, you know, every bi-weekly. So, um, I went to BB&T, my local bank, who I loved. And I basically got a $300,000 line of credit that I could use on up to five houses at a time. And they, they didn't care if I used it to buy, to fix up, to market, to do anything I wanted with it. And that was my first line of credit. That was my first debt. Thanks, Curtis. Thanks again. Uh, you can reach out to me on Bigger Pockets. Bridget LaSalle says, I'd like to write an article for Bigger Pockets site. Is it easy to find the link? Bridget, there is a, a user blog. Uh, there's a reader blog or a user blog on Bigger Pockets. I don't actually have that link. I wonder if anybody else, Nate Shields, anybody else has that link. You should be able to find it. It's like the, the reader's blog, okay? 
Now, Bridget, if you're a great writer, you've got great experience, and you think you want to apply to actually write for Bigger Pockets as a regular blogger, um, write a sample blog. And, and if you feel free to reach out to me, I'd be glad to introduce you to the folks at Bigger Pockets. Hopefully that helps. Flyhead says, okay, you're answering somebody else. By the way, you guys can answer each other. Um, I don't have all the answers. Nate has some that I don't have, but I mean, like, honestly, please feel free to answer each other. Matthew Yates says, have you seen syndications fail? It looks like you're answering Nicholas Webster. Um, yes. Uh, Realty Mogul. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Crowd Street or Realty Mogul? One or the other had a syndication that failed recently and people didn't get all their money back. So yeah, it's absolutely possible that a syndication can fail. You know, leverage is one of the most beautiful things that help you make profit in commercial real estate and residential real estate. It's also one of the most dangerous things because if you lose, you know, a thousand dollars, but it's leveraged, that could become 3000 you lose, right? Well, if, I mean, just like you make 1000 and it becomes 3000 because of leverage, you can do the same thing in the reverse direction. And that absolutely happened a ton in the uh, Great Recession. You're welcome, Matthew. Kevin says, pay off rental properties. When is this wise? I generally don't like paying off rental properties. Uh, as long as you're actively involved in getting more real estate, I would try to get all the equity lines all the HELOCs you can and try to keep, um, you know, using banks money, at least at a reasonable loan to value ratio, you know, um, to continue to keep moving forward. Now, I would start paying them off when you're done. If you got 30 houses and you're, you know, whatever age and you want to retire, you can start paying those down for sure. And I would pay off one at a time. I mean, rather than pay off each one an extra hundred a month, I would use, you know, the strategy of paying off one or two or three or whatever completely first. Dave Ramsey recommends this as well. It's, it's a mental thing. Jamie Reinhardt. How are you, Jamie? Jamie says, I want to get started flipping and holding in Canada. It seems the rules are different here to get going. Can a person living in Canada flip and hold in the U.S.? If so, how? Jamie, I would love to ask somebody else if somebody else has an answer, but I would, see you abs I would say you absolutely could. I have no reason at all to believe you couldn't own property in the U.S. and flip and hold there. I, I don't know how the rules are different in Canada, and I'd be really interested to know if you want to share, but um, I would think it would be absolutely doable. If you're in Windsor, Canada, of, I'm not saying that you are, but if you were, you'd ob you obviously be right across the bridge from Detroit. Or if you're in Toronto, you wouldn't be that far from Buffalo. So, um, yeah, no, I think it's very doable, Jamie, and I think that that would be something to consider. Uh, Tu Fang says, since cap rate is compressing, now cap rate's compressing, folks, means the rate of return is shrinking, which obviously means the price of properties is going up. And that's happening in multifamily, but pretty much every other asset class right now. Since the cap rate is compressing, prices are going up, would you consider building multifamily properties, then refining and keeping the properties? Two fang. I absolutely would. And I would actually consider building those properties for a lower income level. In other words, I would consider building um, at an income level that might be uh, middle income um, or like the working class. You don't have to build a class A plus, stunning, all the amenities, the pools, everything else. Uh, you can possibly build something for workforce housing, as they call it, and I think that could be more profitable. And so to uh, our company, Wellings Capital, is considered investing in a multifamily deal right now, and it is a ground-up development, and I would recommend that. Um, Jamie's in Edmonton, Alberta. So Edmonton is pretty close to the Pacific Northwest, if I'm not mistaken, probably north of Montana, right, or North Dakota. So, um, Jamie, you know, I don't know what to tell you. There's, 
David Green's got a book called Investing. I'm forgetting the name right now, but David Green from Bigger Pockets has a book called Investing Out of State, in out of state real estate, actually, I think. And so you can, I, I think whatever principles David has would be good for you too, Jamie. Um, I'd still like to know how it's different in Canada. Can you give me like three reasons it's different? I'm just curious. Curtis Bennett, my friend, <laughs> my new friend, says, I'm assuming you probably started with single or small multifamily properties. Yes. Was it a big shift getting into those 10 plus door properties? Most of what we plan now is quick flipping smaller houses to rental investors. Curtis, it was a big shift. It was completely different. But I actually went from one single family houses, I did one or two duplexes, one fourplex, and then I jumped up to about 100 units. I didn't ever go through the 5, 10, 20, 30. And I think that's a very good strategy. But um, I've never been through that cycle. But I will say it was definitely a big jump up. I could never, well, I think it would be very, very hard to do without a mentor. And so I love my mentor. I recommend them often. Uh, if you don't afford, if you don't want to get a mentor, or you can't afford it or don't necessarily need one. My other advice would be get so deeply engrossed in every good podcast and every good book you can. You can get a lot of mentoring from books and podcasts and webinars. So um, Nate Shields, Dude Real Estate, says it's called Long Distance Real Estate Investing by David Green. So Jamie Reinhardt, I hope that helps. Um, okay, so if I haven't answered you on Facebook Live, you need to copy and paste your question back in, okay? If I haven't answered you on YouTube, please copy and paste your question back in. I'm gonna do a quick run, answer all the questions I can, and then I'm gonna go out to dinner with my daughter and wife. So, Brandy Bruce, hi Brandy on Facebook. Where are you from? Oh, and there's the answer. You're from Kansas. What do you think about a duplex for 250,000 in Kansas? Brandy, what you're going to want to do is get some of the calculators, some of the tools from bigger pockets and some of the books that we put out and try to evaluate that. Okay. So I would, um, try to evaluate that and see what the cash flow is. You're going to want to make sure you get two to four hundred dollars in free cash flow every month at a minimum okay that's a hundred dollars or more per unit i would like to see you get 200 per unit okay so brandy there's no way to tell if that's a good deal uh, without looking at the numbers and please do yourself a favor be conservative on your evaluations right nate shields okay college trends says question best place for asset protection and tax stuff yeah, we've got a writer, an author on a, of a Bigger Pockets blog called Scott Royal Smith. He's got Royal Asset Protection Services, I think, in Austin, Texas. He's a um, he's a, a legal he's an attorney, and he does asset protection. There's probably other people on Bigger Pockets. Um, now, if you want tax help, uh, that's not Scott Royal Smith. There are two or three great tax strategists that I highly recommend. You're going to need to reach out to me to get their name and contact info. One or two or three of them are around $4,500. One's Brandon Hall, CPA, Bigger Pocket CPA. I highly recommend that you check in with Brandon Hall, but I have others we can recommend as well. Brandon, if you're listening, that's a freebie, buddy. I'm just kidding. We, we don't pay each other just being stupid. Okay. Curtis Bennett says, thanks again, Paul. I have to take off. I plan on getting a lot more active in the forums this year. Thanks, Curtis. Where are you from? All right. We'll chat with you later. Lee Prado says, any good book recommendations for learning more about Airbnb? Yeah, Lee, reach out to me. I have a friend who has a program. I'll tell you in advance. It's 900 or $1,000, I think. Um, he is a fantastic trainer in teaching people how to do corporate, long-term corporate rentals and Airbnb. Highly recommend it. It's the only one I can tell you about. I can tell you guys, listen up. If you're, if you're multitasking right now, you're going to want to hear this. This guy will train you and teach you how to make $10,000 a month 
as a side gig without quitting your day job. And I wrote an article in Bigger Pockets on that in the summer of 2018. Now, 2018, I wrote this article, said you can make $10,000 on the side. Well, two young guys on Bigger Pockets ran with my idea. They got this training I'm telling you about, and they're now grossing 70. That's 70, 70,000 a month from doing corporate rentals and Airbnb. Huh. I think their net profit is over 30,000 a month. Now, I haven't seen their numbers. I haven't seen their, you know, their books to prove that, but I believe it. So check it out. You're going to need to connect with me to get that link. I, I don't have it handy. Nabil Mahmood. Hey, Nabil. Says, what are your go-to sources for finding storage facilities for sale? Number one, driving for dollars. Drive around. Number two, get the phone numbers of all the owners you can and get hold of them. That's really the way I would recommend. Number three, find self-storage brokers that specialize in self-storage. Number four, just build a network on Airbnb, Airbnb, on bigger pockets and elsewhere. So that's what I would do, Nabil. Utkarsh Gautam Gautam says, "Can you answer my question?" Um, okay, so it looks like Nate Shields is answering it, and I'm glad. If you need to clarify your question, please do. Miles Davis says, "Any strategic ideas for getting money for a hard money loan down payment?" Hmm. I pulled from 401k and applied for a HELOC, but unsure if that is recommended. Yeah, I would totally do a HELOC, Miles. I, I always recommend doing uh, a HELOC. So Sheena asks how, and, and that's, and then there's also hard money lenders you can find locally. Um, Curtis says he's in Bogstown, Indiana. Uh, I invest with a guy named Scott Myers. By the way, Nabil Mahmood. Uh, Scott Myers in Indiana has an amazing training program that will teach you to do everything about self-storage. So that would be helpful. Sheena says, how do we connect for that link? Just connect with me. Again, I'm Paul Moore, P-A-U-L-M-O-O-R-E, on Bigger Pockets. Uh, I'm also with Wellings Capital, W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S-C-A-P-I-T-A-L. Oh, I know where you can get that link. I've got a free ebook on self-storage investing. I've got a free ebook on mobile home park investing. And Nabil, you might want that. And I've also got this link to like my friend Al who does this training. You can get all that at the website I'm about to give you. So if you need a pen and paper, grab your pen and paper. I'm going to give you a website to get those links. Okay. It's wellingscapital.com. It's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S, Wellings capital c-a-p-i-t-a-l dot com slash resources wellingscapital.com forward slash resources and you can get all those goodies and more just from uh giving us your first name and email address we'll send it to you um curtis scott myers m-e-y-e-r-s i think he's with selfstorageinvesting.com scott's a friend and scott helped me with my new book on self-storage investing that's going to be coming out this spring with Bigger Pockets Publishing. Can't wait. Sheldon Cantrell says, I have a hornet's nest of a contract that's at the title company and need to know if I have a buyer to assign the contact contract to. Do I have to wait till it clears? And how do I assign it to the buyer? Um, Nate Shields, this is for you, my friend. I don't know. Nabil, you're welcome. Um, you guys are all welcome. You guys are awesome. Uh, drummer Glenn Chin says, can you get a fixed interest HELOC? No, no, I've never heard of one. Never heard one. Never seen one. Uh, I, I've done tons of work with HELOCs, home equity line of credit. And by the way, I highly recommend getting a HELOC as your first mortgage, not as your second, but as your first uh, there's so many reasons. And if you want to know more about that, I don't have, I don't know these guys, but it's called VIP financial education on YouTube. Okay. VIP financial education or reverse your mortgage.com. Um, <laughs> thanks Curtis. Okay. So Kevin Durham says I have no IRV or comparables. How do I make an offer? Should I just lowball and work up Kelvin Durham? I'm sorry. Kelvin, um, 
yeah, you know, I mean, like every house is worth something, but I, I wouldn't do that. I, I think you should go get educated and really, hey, Amber Duncan, I think you should go um, uh, learn all you can and um, get um, get educated and uh, learn, you know, get the ARV, get everything figured out and don't just guess. Okay, Matthew Yates, Matthew Yates says, rest in peace, Neil Peart, Peart, I know that's a technical pronunciation, drumming legend. What? My favorite drummer of all time. You've got to be kidding. Did he pass away? Man, I hope not for a lot of reasons. Anyway, Umar Farouk says, hello, Paul. Hey, Umar. So Amber Turner, what's going on in California? Um, you guys tearing it up out there in the Central Valley? Would love to hear more from you. Picking names sucks. Have a, says, have a fourplex sitting on a large lot. I want to increase income, which would be better. New building with additional units or throwing up storage units? Um, so I would get training on either one of those. I would go to, um, oh my gosh. He died from cancer. I did not know. And he just, he has a young child too, man. His wife and daughter died, you know, in 1998. So that's really, really tragic. I did not know. Um, so I want to increase, I want to, uh, should I build up additional storage units or build more property? Um, it just depends. I mean, you should only do storage units if it's a great location for storage units. And so um, you need to go check out Radius Plus, which is a website which will teach you to figure out whether it's a good location for storage units. You also need to go through Scott Meyer's self-storage investing program. You need to learn a lot more to get an answer to that. So um, Giggity Goo 52 says, politics aside, if every adult were to receive a thousand a month via universal basic income, how would that affect the rental market? Giggity goo. I don't know what to say. Um, I would say it wouldn't. I, I would say it just basically everybody would just waste the money if they got it for free. And so I don't know that it would affect it that much. Maybe a little. I'm not really totally sure, though. So um, I don't know how to answer that. That's that's interesting, though. Someone Z, 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 says, I have only 5,000 savings and want a house hack. Is it possible? Yes. Try to get a HUD loan. Try to get a HUD loan, okay? That's what I would do. Or a VA loan if you qualify. Matthew Mullen says, I'm brand new. What's your number one book to use as a primer on real estate investing and to be able to speak the language of an eventual mentor partner? Um, Matthew, um, there's some great books by Brandon Turner. Go over to the Bigger Pockets bookstore and look for Brandon Turner. Uh, he's got some great books on real estate investing. I don't even know which one I would recommend. There's so many great ones. Uh, there's If you want to get into large multifamily, there's a book. Now I'm forgetting. The Complete Guide to Buying and Selling Apartment Buildings. Um, and so I don't, I don't remember, um, I, I'm just drawing a blank on who that is right now. There's other great multifamily books. I wrote a book on multifamily that's been helpful to some as well. Nelson says, Hey Paul, thank you. Okay. Grease fries is credit score important. It depends what your context is. Not if you're doing rent to own or lease option sandwich subject to, or Airbnb. Those are four things I just threw out really quick, which are great ways to get um, involved in real estate investing if you're a beginner. If you have 5,000 and you're trying to get started, that's where I'd start, by the way. Uh, Airbnb, corporate housing, uh, rent to own, lease option sandwich, and um, that's where I'd recommend. And that's crazy timing because Fifth Seal Ministries, hi, Fifth Seal, says, yeah, Steve Burgess, thanks, Nate was the author of that great book on multifamily. Um, Fifth Seal says, have you ever used a lease option or a sandwich lease? If so, what do you tell a homeowner? Oh yeah, you explain everything. You say, look, Mr. Homeowner, you're about to lose this house. You wanna move on. Look, we'll pay, we'll pay you up to speed. 
we need to take over your mortgage payments. You're not going to make them anymore. We're not going to give you a thousand a month for you to make the payment. We're going to make that payment uh, directly. And then you tell them everything you're going to do. You're basically going to say, I'm going to go in and sweep it out, paint it, fix the landscaping. And I'm going to turn around, get somebody on Craigslist and rent to own it back to them in a few days. And um, so you just basically tell them everything you plan to do. There's no reason not to. And so uh, that would be my answer on that. I hope that helps. Nurb Nurbic Modi says, is it better to buy first a personal house and then buy rental properties or is it better to keep renting and start building a rental portfolio? I would actually keep renting Nur Nurbic. In fact, if I was starting over and if I didn't have a wife who loved to own her own home, I would absolutely rent. Um, I would not buy. Jamie says, do you have the title for your side gig you wrote about? Jamie. Jamie Reinhardt, thank you. I don't know what you mean. And I know I probably said something that makes... Oh, the side gig, yeah. SmithMountainHomes.com uh, I have a side gig where I have a real estate website that generates leads for real estate investors. If that's what you mean, um, it's my side hustle, Jamie. It's SmithMountainHomes.com That's a website where people can come to buy beautiful, amazing resort lakefront properties in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Francisco Jasso says, is accumulating rentals through subject to a good way to go about it? Absolutely. It's, that's the same as the rent to own or lease option sandwich. It just means you're basically subject to, uh, you're keeping the mortgage in place. You don't have to go get your own mortgage. You barely have to even make a down payment. You just take over someone else's mortgage. You want to use a land contract to do that. There's very few people who are experts on this. I can tell you I've done it a bunch of times. I don't do it anymore because now I'm in commercial real estate. Oh, somebody asked me what we do earlier. Uh, Wellings Capital is uh, a front door to people who want to get involved in commercial real estate investing. Self-storage, mobile home parks, uh, multifamily. Um, that's... Uh, that's what we do. Um, but um, anyway, oh, there's a BP glossary. Thank you, JC. Jamie Reinhardt says the side gig she's talking about is Airbnb. Oh, yeah, just just click in with me. Go to wellingscapital.com forward slash resources. Or you can just click into my Bigger Pockets page, and I will be glad to connect you with... Um, uh, I'll be able to connect you with the Airbnb corporate trainer. Um, Oxplug is talking to Nate Shields. Thank you, Nate. Do you like commercial lending versus conventional for small multifamily investing? Well, for one to four units, it's going to have to be residential. Five and up, it's going to have to be uh, commercial lending. So hopefully that helps. Of course, you can always get a home equity loan. Nurburk says, uh, hold on hold old property oh man i don't understand your question could you nurbik nurbik we're about to wrap up here so if you can rephrase your question that'd be great i might have missed it Ham hamza ahmed ahmed did i say it right closing on two fourplexes next week as my first rental property investment i'm inheriting tenants on month-to-month -month leases any tips or tricks to convert to one-year leases um, yeah, you can just go and ask them if they would want to sign a one-year lease and you can tell them you'll give them some kind of a bonus. Maybe you give them a TV or something, you know, I don't know, but I mean, just, you know, try to, try to see if you can get them on one-year leases and tell them the benefit. If you do tell them, you know, if you do month to month, you could raise their rent anytime. Right. But, um, anyway, uh, on a l annual lease, they're locked in for a year, which is a benefit to them. Nurburk says, how old of a property do you buy? I am based in Dallas and everything 200,000 200, below is almost always built in the 80s. Yeah, I would go up from 1979 or newer, maybe 78 or newer. That's when you're going to avoid a lot of the wrought iron pipes, a lot of the asbestos, a lot of the other problems, okay? Uh, Kristen Cliggett says, can you please tell me again what website to visit to find syndication that allows non-accredited investors? I can't find my notes. Sure. Go check out the Real Estate Crowdfunding 
review. Okay. Real estate crowdfunding review. That's Ian Ippolito. Ian Ippolito. Oh, Ian Ippolito. Ian Ippolito has an amazing website called the Real Estate Crowdfunding Review, and he's got ideas for accredited and non-accredited investors. Carlos Perez. Hey, Carlos, sir, I'm looking for a mentor. Can you be my mentor? I get this question a lot. I do limited mentoring, and it's uh, Nate Shields, in fact, who answered a lot of the questions on here today. I mentored him. And if you want to reach out to me at uh, wellingscapital.com, or if you want to reach out to me on my Bigger Pockets site, I can tell you what we could do. And that's for Carlos or anybody. All right. Uh, I missed a lot of questions here. Grease fries, I don't have an answer for you in New York City, except maybe invest somewhere else. Uh, Fifth Seal Ministries, can an attorney write up the contracts for a lease option sandwich? Uh, you're going to want to get a separate contract for the purchase and the lease. Make sure they're separate. I don't have time to explain why. Um, now, if anybody would like to be on my Wednesday follow-up call, I do a call where I try to answer all the questions I cannot get to today. You're going to need to reach out to me at Wellings Capital and uh, wellingscapital.com or my Bigger Pocket site, and we will get you that information. We don't like to share that 800 number because we only want a handful of people on there who are really serious. Um, wise man with no name says, I have a four unit that needs lots of repair. Wow, 440000 but... You you need to put 350 in it. Should I get a bank loan, hard money, or slowly repair myself? I wouldn't do it slowly. No way. I would actually try to get some investors from a local real estate group, uh, maybe get a bank, an equity line, but I would definitely not do it slowly. I would do it as fast as you can, and especially um, because the market's shifting and you know you never know what could happen here. Francisco, best lease option sandwich subject to book. I don't know a single one. I'm sorry. Uh, somebody should write one, seriously. Uh, and uh, But I don't know. Now, if anybody does know, please share with the group. Share with the class. Um, Rob says, I'm in an apartment with two months left on my lease. I'm looking for the cheapest house in booming Dallas suburb. Is it smart to buy retail and rent it out in a year or two or live in a flip? Or flying? I, I would do a flip, Rob. That's just my quick answer. I don't know all the, 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 you know, all the details. Uh, that you might be considering. Sally says, I'm considering a non-QM loan. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. Hamza, I met a team of agents who run a property management company managing 150 units. Uh, yes, I would ha absolutely recommend that you shadow them and use them for free mentoring. And you offer like your SEO skills or your hard work or maybe be a runner for them or go be a rent collector. Just do something really, you know, that they don't want to do and they'll love you. And um, hopefully you can get a mentor that way. Okay, Hamza. Okay, everybody. Thank you. I would love to talk more. I'm already a minute over my absolute limit. I'm probably going to get in trouble from bigger pockets. So Thank you. I can't believe I get to do this. I'm so grateful to all of you. I'm so grateful to Bigger Pockets. If this helped you in any way, please give us a thumbs up, a like, or a share. And please check out my new article on Bigger Pockets, which is one simple mindset shift to help you raise millions for your real estate deals. It's not out yet, but I hope it'll be out within a few days. Okay. Thanks again. I look forward to seeing you all here next Friday, 2 p.m. Mountain, 4 p.m. Eastern on Bigger Pockets Live. Thanks again. We'll talk soon.